Welcome to another video from Lockdown Electronics with me, Bill. Uh, and we're going to enter the world of digital electronics again, but we're going to also enter the world of analog electronics too, because we're going to look today at the conversion process from analog to digital. Now, it's quite a complicated subject, so apologies in advance. Um, there is a um, reasonable amount of theory to get through, which will hopefully explain what's going on uh, when we actually get onto the bench and look at a circuit on the breadboard. Um, it's also something which uh, gets used all the time. You know, things are converted from analog to digital in your mobile phone, in your oscilloscope, in your digital multimeter. Loads and loads of places uh, make use of this process. So it is really an important part of, of analog and digital electronics. Now, most textbooks that I read uh, talk about the digital to analog conversion first and then go on to talk about analog to digital. And I can see why they do that. That's because um, digital to analog is a, a lot, a lot simpler process. Um, however, for me, I think it um, makes more sense to start by taking an analog signal, digitizing it, and then having a look at um, how we do that. So, uh, without further ado, let's have a look at uh, the analog to digital conversion process. We'll start by looking at the analog to digital conversion process. Now I've got a few slides to get through here, so I'll try and be as quick as possible. But I want to start with a bit of a disclaimer. I'm a hobbyist and not an expert in this field, and the A to D process I'm about to describe is not exactly how the chip does it that we're going to use later on. Um, really, this is uh, uh, to get you um, thinking about how you might approach converting an analog voltage into a, a digital number or a, or a binary number. So let's imagine we've got um, 16 steps, so 0 to 15 here, and they correspond to 0 to 15 in 4-bit binary that you can see there. Then we get ourselves a comparator. One input of the comparator will be taken from this uh, reference voltage table, and the other input will be our external voltage that we're trying to measure. So if we cycle through these uh, values, we we'll hopefully eventually come across one that agrees with the input, and then the output of the comparator will change, and we have our uh, conversion. So let's just see how that might work in practice. Let's say we've got an input that happens to correspond to, let's say, 7. So as we start our scan here, we've got an input at 7 and a reference at, well, 1 or 2, something like that. Therefore, the output of the comparator is going to be false, and that will continue that way until we get to 7, in which case the output of the comparator will change. And so that effectively means that the value we're going to assign to that input voltage is 0, 1, 1, 1. And that's um, an example of a, a conversion process. As I said, this chip doesn't do it that way. It uses something called successive approximation, which is a great deal quicker. And if you're really keen on understanding this, you can obviously look up successive approximation algorithms, uh, but also refer you to page 11 of the TI datasheet because uh, that's got a really detailed description of how this actually works. Um, and it takes a bit of understanding, but um, it is, I think, uh, quite a good way of understanding it. So I think the next thing to say there is, OK, that's probably not too bad for 16, 16 steps. If we'd got 8-bit conversion, which we have in this chip, well, that's 256 steps. That's going to take longer. If you've got 16-bit resolution, that's just over 65,000 steps. That's going to take even longer still. So just cycling through every one isn't necessarily very effective because if the voltage is quite uh, uh, converted quite early in the in the, the, the scan, then the answer you'll get quickly. If it's towards the end, it's going to take longer. So there are better ways to do it, and that's what successive approximation attempts to do. As I say, this is just uh, how you might approach it. So looking at the chip itself then, the ADC0804, it's a 20-pin dual in-line package, and uh, it's a 5 volt supply CMOS device. Um, first thing to note is that on pins 4 and 19, it's possible to connect a resistor and a capacitor between those two and ground, and that allows you to access an internal Schmidt trigger which produces a clock oscillator. So you can run this chip independently, uh, which is very handy, and that's what we're going to do. 
Uh, over if you don't want to do that, if you want it to be in time with your processor or something else, then you can simply feed your clock into uh, pin 4 and the chip will dance at the speed you want it to dance at up to obviously its, uh, its operational limit, which as I say doesn't matter for the purposes of today. Okay, the other thing to note is that um, pin 3, when taken low, starts a conversion. We're going to hold pins 1 and 2 uh, low for the whole of this because they, they need this chip select and the, and the read um, are both active low so we're just going to keep those low, That's that works for us. So if we take pin 3 low it starts a conversion. The conversion occurs, it takes quite a few clock cycles, we'll measure that later and the output then appears on pins 11 to 18 as uh, data bits 0 to 7 and once that's done uh, pin 5 outputs an interrupt, it goes low and that tells wh whatever it is the system you're working with that uh, an output has been uh, is now available to be read conversion is complete and in the, our case by connecting the, that pin pin 5 to pin 3 we can effectively tell the chip to once it's done one conversion to start another that'll make more sense when you look at the circuit so let's do that so uh, I think that's relatively straightforward. This circuit comes directly from the TI datasheet. It's a very comprehensive datasheet. If you want to explore this topic further, I'd encourage you to look at it because it really does contains some good information. So uh, hopefully you can see there we've got at the top a 10K resistor and the capacitor which are providing the um, uh, control for the internal oscillator. And then pins 3 and 5 are connected together, that allows the interrupt to go low and drive the next conversion and I've got a little uh, normally open switch there to manually start the conversion if, if we need to do that, which occasionally you do and then the um, analogue inputs are on um, on pin 6 and it's differential uh, onto pin, uh, pin 7 and 8 there so you can uh, have uh, both a, a plus and a minus input should you so desire it OK, inside the chip, as you can imagine, it's fairly complicated. Top right hand side there, just below the uh, AND gate, you can see the Schmidt trigger and it shows a couple of external components there on pins 19 and 4, which is the clock I've just described. Uh, and then a little bit further down on the left hand side, uh, almost at the bottom, you've got V in and uh, plus and V in minus, pins 6 and 7. Differential input hopefully uh, provides some decent common mode noise rejection. They go straight into a comparator. The output of that comparator feeds a latch, and then the various logic uh, things inside the uh, chip eventually complete a conversion. And at the stage of conversion is complete, that is latched onto the tri-state output latch at the bottom, which makes the outputs available on pins to 11 to 18. And then again, bottom right, there's a reset, sorry, a interrupt pulse goes low momentarily uh, to advise the external system that uh, a new output is available. So that's the internals of the chip. Again, that's from the TI datasheet, uh, definitely worth a look. Uh, so here's the circuit we saw earlier. Let's see how that appears on the breadboard. It really is uh, hopefully relatively straightforward. Push button switch on the left. Uh, and then you've got the capacitor and the resistor um, on the left hand end of the chip there which are providing the external components for the Schmidt trigger oscillator uh, various pins tied low and high tantalum capacitor on the power supply at the top and then you've just got the eight wires going to eight current limiting resistors which are driving the um, eight LEDs so we can uh, view the output state there you go, that's quite a lot to get through. Hopefully you've hung on in there if you have well done. Let's now go to the bench and have a look at that on the breadboard. OK, here's the ADC0804 set up on the breadboard as you've just seen. Um, now currently I've got a 220 picofarad capacitor here and I'll uh, explain why I've got that in a moment uh, but you can see push button switch to start it there's the tantalum here are the um, eight LEDs so power is on and currently all the LEDs are off so I'm going to just press the push button switch once to make absolutely sure that she's running like that and actually I would expect all the LEDs to to be out because 
what I've got here is I've just got a little jumper lead. I can switch between um, the positive and the negative rail. If currently, let's go on to the uh, opposite one, and as you can see, yeah, uh, it converts to um, a full 255 there, or uh, all eight bits are on. If I go back to the other supply rail, uh, it's zero. So we can see the chip is working. Now, whilst he's working, let's just get the scope probe and uh, to do that I'm going to use uh, just this little jumper because it makes it easy. I'm going to pop that onto uh, the output of the uh, pin 4 there and this is the trace that we get. I'm just using a scope grab so it's easier to see. Uh, and with a 220 picofarad, picofarad capacitor we've got about 321 something like that kilohertz uh, clock frequency. And uh, what the other thing to note there is if you look closely you can see that classic slightly curved shape of the uh, charge and discharge um, cycle of the capacitor so we can fairly quickly infer there if you hadn't already worked it out that there's an inverse relationship between the value of the capacitor and the frequency of the clock obviously within uh, the parameters of the, the circuit um, but the size of the capacitor controls the um, speed of the clock. Now the reason I've put a 220 picofarad in there at the moment, which is a bit bigger than they recommend, is because I want to do a little uh, test. So just with the um, frequency in mind there, um, 321.667, I'm now going to move the scope probe onto pin 3 there and just readjust the settings and we get this. Now that is uh, a scope grab of the interrupt pulse going low and it's going low every, well it says the frequency is 4.58804 kilohertz. Um, I don't know entirely sure how accurate that is but it gives you an idea and if you divide that by the clock frequency that gives us about 70 cycles of the clock for every uh, interrupt pulse. So a conversion is taking place roughly every 70 cycles. Um, so I did bit, the, think the data sheet does talk about 64 plus a few for other bits and pieces. So the chip is managed to convert every uh, 70 clock cycles. So now what we're going to do is just take the power off and I'll just take out the 220 picofarad capacitor because one of the textbooks I've got suggests that you use 50 picofarad. Well, I've actually got the nearest I've got 56, so that will have to do. So I'm going to put the 56 one in there and we'll power back on again. And hopefully, pressing the button, we should get some. Yep, yeah, that is working. So we've got 56 picofarad, uh, and if we now pop the scope onto the um, clock there. Uh, you can see with a 56 picofarad capacitor we're getting about 647.5 kilohertz, kilohertz. So based on um, that 70 uh, clock cycles to produce a conversion, uh, we're managing a conversion with a 56 picofarad capacitor roughly every 96 microseconds, something like that. I used the larger value capacitor so I could get a uh, hopefully a more accurate um, estimate of the number of clock cycles um, uh, bit per, per interrupt. Uh, you do get a similar answer with the 56 but I was just trying to improve the accuracy a little bit. So every 96 microseconds uh, that chip is producing a new um, ADC value uh, which is hopefully good. So I'm going to take the power off for a moment and I'm going to now put the uh, input, the analog input, across uh, a potentiometer that's just uh, across the um, supply rails. So we'll power back up and press the button once, make sure she is running. What I'm now going to do is very gently turn this pot between the two supply rails and keep your eyes on the LEDs and hopefully you'll start to see this clearly a changing value. Remember that's going on every there's a conversion every 96 microseconds, so it's a little bit faster than me, but you can hopefully see now that we are clearly counting in binary. Obviously, it's a fairly coarse potentiometer, but look for that one going out fairly soon. Yep, there she is, that one's gone out now. 
and as I keep on going turning the value down hopefully you should see that one go out fairly soon yeah so you can see we're counting down now and there is your analog to digital conversion now reading zero I'll go, go back up again and you can see it, there isn't enough resolution in the pot to get you an exact figure but uh, can I get to one should we try and see if I can get to one yeah there you go there's one and there's uh, well, that would be binary too, but actually it's um, 10, 11. And so we keep on going, and slowly but surely we climb up those 8-bit numbers, and you can see that's one come we're cycling through, that one will come on next. And then we'll start, and then that should start to stay on soon. Yeah, there we go. And that one will start to stay on. So we're counting nicely up until eventually, there we go, we can see it there. Uh, And eventually we'll get to the almost the full supply rail. We've obviously got a little bit of loss with the pot. But there you can hopefully see the analog to digital conversion um, occurring. And um, rather satisfying to watch it, actually. Uh, maybe that says more about me, or maybe I should get out more. I don't know. But there you go. That's real live A to D conversion yeah, in, in, um, in action. Okay, well there you have the analog to digital conversion process, or at least my version of it anyway. As I mentioned uh, during the slides, I'm not an expert on this, and I'm sure there's plenty of you out there who know a great deal more, but I'm just a hobbyist, and um, it's something I've been learning about while I've been putting the video together, and I hope uh, for some of you that's uh, uh, you know, allows you to learn something too. Um, it's a fascinating topic and clearly it's unfinished because we've now um, produced a digital signal so let, or if you like we've produced a, a digital number so what are we now going to do with that well I'm going to produce at least another one possibly two maybe even more videos where we look at converting the digital signal back into analog so uh, you can watch out for that video that will be coming soonish hopefully and uh, It'll hopefully make some sense when it's tied in with this one. Thanks very much for watching. If you're in the market for a multimeter, um, can I ask you to check out the Kai Wheats ones? There's some links in the description. I mention those because uh, not only do I use those meters and I find them fine and uh, perfectly adequate for what I do. Uh, if you do use them, there's a disc. If you do. Uh, want one there's a discount code in the description and that discount code uh, also helps the channel um, allows me to fund some of these things that i'm doing um, and for that i'm very grateful so thanks very much see you on the next video